like to briefly introduce our next speaker, who is uh, Professor Jamie Pike from uh, EPFL uh, in Switzerland. She is associated with the National Competence Center for Robotics Research in Switzerland. She was previously at uh, Harvard University, and she has a long-standing uh, interest in what's called soft robotics and robot origami, you know, that the Japanese folding technique, you know, where you can make all these uh, nice things. Now, uh, uh, instead of doing it, you know, with regular paper, you know, doing it with the uh, robotic structures. So, uh, is everything set up? So, hi, Jamie. Hi, Jamie, can you hear us? Hi. Hi, Rolf. Thanks for an introduction. Hi. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, I think uh, the, if you're ready, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Rolf. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jamie Pack, and I will introduce you to the soft robotics. Um, how do we define it? Why do we need it? And how do you attack the challenge? And that's the primary goal of my research, and uh, hopefully you will enjoy the talk. The world we live in is not a Baba Papa world. Baba Papa world is where the single entity can transform its body into multiple shapes, multiple uh, for multiple tools, from a single um, globby looking pink um, uh, entity. But the world that, in reality, in the world we live in, it's never the, the case. The, live, the world we live in is inherently more stiff, um, not as dynamic. It does not have an inherent compliancy or flexibility. So why is it important? Because we, as humans, we are soft. So in order to bring uh, soft robotics into our lives means that things are going to be more intuitive, more um, adaptive, and more easy to use for our everyday lives instead of having to fear for the safety or how to control the robots or how do they even work. If they are so conveniently surrounding us omniversely, then we don't really have to worry about how they're functioning to begin with. For example, uh, us humans, we have um, 43 muscles in the face alone. So when we smile or talk, there are 43 muscles that are acting together in, in combination to give the softness of a smile. However, imagine trying to build a Terminator using the conventional motors, um, creating the 43 muscles on the sides of the face, it will be almost impossible. And maybe that's why the Terminator could never smile. So how do you address this? Us as engineers, we've always been so much fascinated by you know, how the human work. And we've been trying to recreate the softness of smile as well. So how have we done this? For example, the, uh, the eye you see on the left-hand side, the human eyes produce about three degrees of freedom on the, uh, on the pupil. So when it activated, it mo moves in a very fast saccadic motion up to 600 or 800 degrees per second. And by doing so, we can look at many other um, subjects, even when you're not really consciously noticing it. But would you call that a soft robot or a soft structure? We'll get back to that later. For example, think about the hand and the arm of a human. These are some examples of a humanoid hand and an arm. The finger that you see there, it has uh, eight degrees of freedom. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, it does have more than eight joints. However, there are eight active degrees of freedom where we can control the movement of the finger. And then, uh, for example, the arm that you see on the bottom screen, it has seven degrees of freedom, starting from the shoulder all the way down to the wrist. So are these, do they look soft to you? Maybe not, because not only because it's the material are made out of um, steel or aluminum, but because it lacks in the degrees of freedom. They don't have enough degrees of freedom as human body does. Human body are not made of joints 
or um, parallel mechanisms or links. They're more like ma made up with bundles of fine or thicker muscles. And in the current state of technology, we don't have that kind of um, actuators. So what are the good examples of a multiple degrees of freedom? Because that's the one I want to achieve. And the good example is origami. Origami, it's not a robot just yet. It's a flat sheet of paper that you can fold in multiple different ways by knowing the consequence or sequence of each fold. And having different folds, we can decide what shape you're going to make at the end. So with a single piece of paper, the number or the variety of the shapes that you can make are infinite. So imagine, what if we can make this process all automatic instead of us having to fold every fold, every pleat, and remembering the sequence of it, how about if we make them automati automatized, make a robotic origami? Where do we start? How do you start making robotic origami? Um, so we probably need a body that's as thin as a sheet of paper. We probably need some actuators to, um, to, or motors that will be able to control the movement of each fold. And imagine if these, each fold or pleats are as small as possible, like a mesh. Then you can imagine it would be able to act, uh, act like a paper origami. And the mathematicians have come to a conclusion where if you make them into triangular shapes, that will be most versatile pattern for an origami structure. So this is a schematic um, that we made for a potential origami, a uh, robogami, I mean. Um, so by being able to control every single fold or every single plate, we can control what shapes it's going to transform into. The, um, the space shuttle, the flat sheet, the ball shape that went through the hole, they are using about 40 degrees of freedom on that single sheet. So if you were to look at um, the proof of concept that I had made and previously, this is one of the proof of concept where about these, this is about five and a half centimeters by five and a half centimeters um, in square altogether has 40 degrees of freedom in each folding edge, and it can create a couple of different shapes from a single sheet of robogami. The first one was obviously a triangle, and the second one is, I think it turns into a frog and then a hexagon. So frog with four legs, and then it gets into a flat hexagonal shape. So that was one uh, example of the uh, proof of concept of the robogami. And then we have another one with a different composition of materials and different motors. So the next one is, I think, it's two, two shapes going from a three-dimensional pyramid. So the materials are different, but the idea of carrying on the robogami is similar. And this one is becoming a space shuttle from a, a single uh, robogami sheet. So they're both about you know size of your palm, if you have a bigger hands, maybe half of your palm size. But what are the technical challenges to go to a step further? What, how do you make a multiple infinite number of the shapes that you want to create that it reacts to the environment? What are the key challenges that we have to address? The major and the most important challenge is the actuators. Unless you have the correct motors that that understands the com comment in the programming, you won't be able to control how this uh, robogami works. The second is the circuitries or electronics. They need to be able to bend and move out of the shape and still be functional and still maintain its conductivity throughout the transformation of a robogami. Another is the body of the robot itself. Not only it needs to stay stiff in the areas that we, when we want them to be, but also be very flexible and supple when we want them to stay and transform. So like I said, the actuator, the electronics, and then the body of the materials is super important for achieving the overall um, active degrees of freedom of a robot. And then Actually, because the robogami is such a thin shape, that it's super important that have them in a full integrated circuit and a full integrated body in all single entity. 
So here you can see a couple of layers of the, um, of the robogami. They are representing a device layer, a structural layer, and the circuit layer and the via layer. That the via layer will be able to connect all the layers from top to bottom so that their, inter their electrical uh, integration is complete. The circuit layer must be there so that we can carry on the command throughout the sheet between the edges, between the folding, uh, folding uh, folds. The structure layer is able to maintain the form of the shape of the robogami. Um, that's why it needs to create, be, be able to create it in the multi-material sense so that we can choose and pick and choose which side will be stiff or not as stiff. So what are the challenges in creating a, a motor in a, such a thin matter? Because it's such an unconventional and very um, odd uh, proportion to its uh, torque output, it's important to look at different types of material because with conventional wire or electric motors or pneumatic motors are not quite suited for this scale. So we look into the, uh, the domain of uh, smart materials. Smart materials are the materials that react to temperature, um, UV light, uh, chemical uh, pH level or chemical fume so depending on the, what kind of uh, smart material you use, you can use it as an uh, actuating force. So here in the chart, you can look at a couple of different uh, smart materials that can be possible candidates for creating a new, new generation of actuators. I have chosen, among these um, choices, I have first generation, I chose a SMA, also known as a shape memory alloys. They're thermally activated, and once and then they can be annealed to memorize the shape they are in a different uh, crystal state. So in creating a low profile actuator, which is also known as um, an actuator that can be embedded within the robogami, it's able to make 180 degrees from a zero to 180 degrees range of motion in about one to two hertz of speed. Um, for, in order to make this actuator, it's important to go through a, a new sequence of design process, not only in the actuator itself and the body, but also in the annealing process. And then once this annealing process is properly done, we can actually uh, embed a new memory to the shape memory alloy so that it will move in the domain or in the range that we want it to move. So next question is, if you, are to, if you already have a flat actuator that can be embedded within the half a millimeter thickness robogami, how do you keep these uh, actuators connected to the programming center or from the sensors or to the body? It's through the electronics and sensors. Um, the example is shown here on the screen. It's a, it's a tiled, uh, triangular tiled uh, robogami with uh, red LED lights uh, embedded. And when you, if you see with a hand crumbling the sheet, you can see it still maintains the conductivity even when it's crumbled more than one or twice. So to us, it's very important that the Robogami is able to fold multiple times. So from the four square tile, it should be able to fold into two square tile and then fold another time to create a single tile. And this is the secret or the, um, the concept of origami, being able to transform into multiple different shapes, not only from uh, the shape or structure point of view, but also in the volumetric sense as well. But in order to do that multiple folds, the electronics must stretch out with the folds as well. And because this, the nature of the robogami is multi-layer structure with multiple materials in between, the circuit layer must stretch out during the fold of the origami as well. So what are the options or what are the um, possible solutions for carrying this out? So there are a couple of solutions that we went through different in the different generations. And this is one of the first ones that we already uh, conceived where we introduced a mesh, a very fine micro-sized mesh in the copper circuit directly. So by creating small holes and the copper, uh, copper circuit, it has inherent uh, flexibility now. And even if it were to go beyond its, um, uh, before it's a plastic deformation area, because we embed uh, silicone rubber in between the mesh, the, the flexibility or the resilience of the silicone rubber springs right back into the shape. 
so that the, uh, the conductivity is maintained while the stretching is going uh, on during the transformation of robogami. Also, the, uh, the size and then the uh, popu uh, population and the density of the, these uh, meshes are very important in deciding how much of a strain they can take during the transformation. Another solution to uh, making a conductive and a stretchable electronics is by using a liquid metal, uh, something like mercury. Here we used egain, which is a non-toxic version of mercury, and we filled a very stretchy rubbery type of silicone um, microchannel with this uh, liquid metal. And because liquid metal has no specific form, it takes the form of the microchannel that we put it in. So once it's put into the syringe and then put it into the microchannels, we can stretch out as far as we want. About 300 uh, a strain can be achieved with this, um, this way. And you can see the light is still on um, during, throughout the whole stretching process. We use the same principle to continue to make more sensors. And the sensors are important to be uh, flexible as well because for Robogami, we add the circuit layer on top of the body itself. So during the transformation, it should still be able to not only um, stay onto the body, but also reading proper reading during the transformation of the robot. So one of the sensors that we had developed is a curvature sensor using liquid metal again. So the liquid metal is filled into microchannel while you have a different um, a pillar that pushes onto the channel itself. Because of the deformation of the channel, the resistance of the liquid metal changes uh, depending on the, uh, the pressure that, that is on, on, the, on the channel. And we can achieve up to um, 500 to 700 microns of thickness um, uh, uh, sensors that can be attached directly on top of the tiles. And here you can see uh, how the resistance, while keeping the resistance constant uh, or the, the power input constant, you can see the resistance of the curvature, uh, resistance of the liquid metal cha channel changes depending on the uh, range of motion that it's taking. So what are the other options? So this is the latest thing we were trying, is uh, using carbon uh, fiber. Carbon fibers are, uh, these days they come in a very small uh, nano size particles, and they're, they're conductive. So by having it embedded with a silicone layer, which is inherently stretchable, and because it's carbon particles are extremely small, they are like a suspended little conductive, metal, uh, a conductive particle suspended in the middle um, silicone uh, interface. And because it's silicone is stretchable, we can use this as if we are using a, a liquid metal. Whereas a liquid metal, it's, it's much more um, temperate, so we need to be super careful with uh, uh, using the liquid metal and how we inject it to the microchannel. Whereas using this um, carbon fiber-based uh, silicon material, it's very stable and we can do multiple um, processes with a finer scale. So we are hoping that this will work much better. So with all the layers mentioned, the important thing right now is um, having all this proof of concept puts them together and having an integrated Robogami with integrated um, sensors on top. And now if that's all achieved, what are the possible applications of Robogami? There are many applications depending on what you're looking for. However, having a, such a high degrees of freedom in the Robogami will enable it to conform to many difficult surfaces that are very unconventional to use. For example, for human face, human body, or a live uh, animal. There, there, there's no um, hard edges or pivot points or, or some air hook that you can attach the uh, robots or exoskeleton or a device to. The best thing we've used so far is a scotch tape or band-aids or even a cast. And imagine if you can replace them with a very intelligent Robogami that knows where to conform itself into and that knows which stiffness you need. So instead of having a cast all the time, you can have a soft and stiff areas that depends on your condition. So more practically, what am I working on right now? One of the uh, uh, projects that we're working on now is by having a Robogami that's going to be used for a facial prosthesis. So 
what happens is after following a facial palsy, people lose their sensation in the face. And by having a rubogami that's embedded with sensors and, um, and that can be able to form itself around the face, the vital status of the facial muscles can send back to the robogami, and the robogami can react to it by giving a little electrical current signals or actually physically exercising the facial muscles. Another grand and very exciting project we're working on is uh, with a group in the EPFL who are, uh, who are um, studying the effect of uh, neuroprosthetics on a paralyzed rats. Currently, their device has a treadmill and a weight support system. However, what they need is an exoskeleton for a rat that's about 200 grams and be able to move its leg instead of having a physical therapist next to it all the time. And by that means, you can have a controlled movements. You can have a exact uh, output, control outputs of what has been done to the rat. So what we are envisioning is in a, during the concept of origami, we are envisioning a system that robogami that um, encompasses or uh, robogami that um, robogami suit that the rat could wear on its hip area and the lower leg area so that it can control the movement of the rat. Again, the concept of origami still carries on because the shape of the leg changes all the time. And unlike human, the rats have very flexible or very loose skin on top of their muscles. So there is not much of a boundary or there's nothing that's fixing the skin back to the muscle. Hence, it's very important that the device that's attached to the outer side or other side of the skin of the rat must be able to conform very nicely during the transformation or during the walking process. So one of the solutions that we are looking at is de uh, developing another soft actuator other than SMA. SMA is uh, it's great for a flat sheet. However, for the rat who has a, who requires much more torque on the areas in the joints, we need something more um, uh, uh, that produces more torque at the end. So these are a couple examples of the soft actuators that we are building. They're made of a silicon rubber again, and they're flexible, they're stretchy, uh, but, but by having uh, multiple chambers that are connected by an airway, we can control the shape and then stiffness and then the torque output at the end effector. And we envision putting these on directly onto the suit by having a selective areas on the, uh, the body of the rat, we can decide which actuator to put where, and we can design specific soft actuators for specific regions. Again, these are the new concept of actuator, so that we don't really need to have a real exact def uh, defined pivot point, which we don't have as a living being. We don't have an exact pivot point where the kneecap is, we don't have exact pivot point where the hip joint is, because we have a lot more degrees of freedom than a single pivot point. And by having an actuator that that, can, that has inherent compliancy, we can decide we don't have to have an exact pinpoint, but as long as the endpoint has a uh, sufficient torque, we can expect to have a very uh, uh, great result during the uh, testing period. So if I were to wrap up, the soft robot has a grand challenge. It's a different paradigm of technology. It's a different way of looking at robotics. It's another way of bringing robots closer to our lives and blending seamlessly into our lives. But one of the biggest challenges that I think is the hardware. The hardware that, compos that is composed of actuators, electronics, and the body itself, and to have them all integrate a single entity. Also, we have to look at the software, not only in the sense of a simulator, but as actually a, a physical modeler that can, ha that can bring in the different effects of the actuator, different effects of the material itself, which are not quite um, nicely done just yet. So I think if the both world comes in together, I think there's going to be a much better future in soft robotics that can be closer to us. So thank you. And... Um, I'm ready for your questions. All right. Okay. Thank you very, very much, uh, Jamie. Uh, this was Thanks, absolutely uh, fascinating. And I think we got another look into the future, you know, what the future might actually be like in terms of really, really advanced robotic technologies. And one of the things that I also find fascinating is that 
uh, materials are beginning to play an increasing role in robotics. Also, if you look at biological systems, of course, the materials, you know, the muscles, the skin, and what have you, are crucial for the behavior, for, you know, control of behavior, for uh, uh, designing uh, behavior. So I think uh, what you've told us is really at the very core of embodied intelligence because a lot of the, let's so to speak, intelligence or functionality is already contained in the material characteristics of the system. Right. right. So right. that's why it's very important to have a, I think it's a f very important to have a physical model simulator. <laughs> the simulator is a very roughly used term, but in order to have a physical model, it's very important to understand all the effects of the material. And then on top of that, we are putting the actuators. So the combination of this would bring a different uh, aspect to controlling robots. And especially if they're in a modular form, I think it will be really important to put them all together. So. Right. OK. So uh, I would like to open the uh, global virtual lecture hall to uh, questions. So do we have? Uh, questions? Uh, yeah? We, we have a question from Moscow. Okay, go ahead. Hmm? Uh, I would like to know whether your construction is uh, resistant to the external pressure. For example, if I take a pyramid or a space shuttle and press it like this, can you see? Yep. Will it uh, regain the previous form or maybe uh, slide or I think that um, currently it does not have a the 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 prototypes you saw on the video they don't have a sensors embedded just yet but with the embedment of a sensor you will be able to detect pressure and then we can control the motors depending on how much of external pressure it is experiencing so to the limit of the torque uh, production of the motor yes you will be able to withstand the pressure but it really depends on the, what the limit of the uh, structure is. Currently, the prototypes that are built are under seven grams in total, so they're super light structures um, that can actually transform from one form to another, but not for a robust, um, robust uh, collision, per se. But it is an open option once the uh, sensors are embedded. Okay. I hope that answered your question, yeah. Right, so uh, do we have more? No, Budapest here. Yes, go ahead. Hi, uh, so I'm wondering, uh, what do you foresee in terms of batteries? Because uh, you really want to integrate uh, all the power sources, and uh, at that point you start adding weight into the structure, so it changes everything, the, the whole concept. True. Um, and it, so far, my aim is not to uh, integrate all the power sources. The, the integration is, is extent to the uh, circuits and um, the sensors. Eventually, it will be very nice if you can have uh, all the power sources included, but that's not right now. It's my expertise. But I do foresee having uh, some, some type of uh, sun panels or a uh, high capacitance source to be embedded into the, into, the, into the origami. But then again, I think it has, like you said, it, uh, the, the payoff of the weight must be considered, and for it to be completely uh, untethered from the power source, that's another thing to consider. Okay, maybe we, we can take uh, another question. From the global yeah, after from all. Berlin. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Hello. Um, yes, go ahead. Yeah, um, is there any plan to implement a kind of a computer system in uh, those Robogami so they can adapt by themselves to new situations? Yes, um, so that, that's under research right now, and um, I think that would come in very handy because we are expecting to have very much a distributed sensor system onto, on the body directly. So the, the controlling of the information, what's being read by all the sensors in the different parts of the body would come in very handy for uh, programming the, what, how, how it realizes the environment next to it. 
So the advantage of it would be um, you don't have to use cameras directly. Even if you don't have camera from the pressure and curvature and temperature sensor, you can still, uh, there's a certain level of the information you can deduct from it and hopefully it can react to the environment that way. Okay, maybe we can take one last question and then uh, do we have another question? Maybe, maybe I can uh, ask uh, about the uh, well control. As I was mentioning, you know, part of the control is contained in the material characteristic. For example, these uh, soft, uh, you know, air chambers. Right. Now I was wondering what. So, in, in in a sense, you could argue that control is extremely distributed in the system. Now, right. what is the relation between, let's say, centralized control, what you want to do with the system, and you know, distributed? So, how do you think about this uh, relation? So, I am trying to. So that, that's a very good question because we are constantly asking the same thing, um, and it really depends on the actuators as well. Because we are in the process of developing new actuators, so do we change the whole concept of uh, programming or the control depending on each actuator, or do we think in more of the robogami sense? We just look at the module and then see what's input and what the output is. So that's the same question we are asking all the time, and. Currently, the direction we are trying to take is stay in the concept of Robogami, where we are looking at each module if, and then looking at the input and output se separately. However, like you said, if you're really working with the rubber material all the way as an actuator and the body form all together, then it needs to get another level of sophistication, seeing not only as an entity, but how it reacts to the next module too. But currently, we are looking at in a more of a global sense. Right. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's of course uh, you know issues that we're also thinking about, and I think soft robotics is really uh, a very, very important development in the field of robotics, and I would say embodied intelligence in general. So, Jamie, thank you once again for being with us and sharing your ideas and your research with us. Okay. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you. Bye. So, bye, Jamie. Bye-bye. So